Are you having one of those weeks too? Um, friends of mine who uh, understand these kind of things have told me that Mercury is in retrograde. Um, and that means don't check any luggage if you're flying and uh, other things. But it's been one of those weeks, even though we're only into the second day. Um, we're waiting now for um, Professor Castillo, who... Uh, uh, I know hopefully we'll be here, um, but I'd like to talk to you about a few things first. So um, the first thing is some reminders. The first one is that Barbara had um, um, a member of her family die back east, and she has gone to New York, and instead of the funeral being on Sunday, they had it yesterday, so she won't be back today. Shatea and I are all alone. Stephanie's had some medical stuff she's going to have taken care of, so we're the, we're the team without any backup. Um, Barbara said to tell you that she will have your papers for you if you need them tomorrow during her office hours. Okay. Uh, the second thing is One of the requirements for the course is that you write papers called notable quotes. And one of the um, things about the notable quotes is that three of them are due on separate weeks by the 23rd, which is two weeks or the week of. Um, let's see. Today's the 7th. The week of the 21st. You need to have three of them in. For those of you who haven't read your syllabus, this is probably new information to you. So um, you need to get one in this week, next week, and the following week if you're to do all three. Does anybody have a question about a notable quote? Um, I'm going to take a minute to just kind of go over the notable quotes. The first thing is there's a model for how to do them in your syllabus. We wanted to show you exactly uh, a model or a prompt how to do them, which means you take a quote from the reading that you think is particularly um, important or interesting, and you write an essay around that quote. One of the things that has been happening in my sections, and if you're in our section, you can uh, discard this if you're, this doesn't apply to you, is my students have been quoting facts beyond the quote, doing a fairly good job of um, showing where the quote comes from, but you are not citing where your information comes from. Now, part of that reason may very well be that you don't know where to cite. But if you cite a fact that is in the text, that you found in the text, it is appropriate to tell us what page you found it in and also which text you found it in. Okay, I just wanted to point that out. Most of the students in here are my students. I teach three of the sections. Any questions about notable quotes? Tomorrow, beginning tomorrow, we will be handing out a study guide for the midterm, which is the week of the 21st. Hopefully, we'll give you some information on what to study and what we expect you to know. Um, I'm sure you're all, hopefully, if you've been paying attention and on the same page with us. We have some idea of some of the things that we think are important. Because one of the things about the course is that not only do you need to spit back the information to us, I hate to put it that way, but 
at some point along the way, someone is going to find out or understand that you've taken a course like this. And they might very well expect you to have some, an informed opinion. Not just an opinion, but an informed opinion. And so it's those things that we think you might need to include if you're to have an informed opinion. Yes? Yeah. I was just, um, no, 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 back. I'll get you. It's the same it's thing. Set on the syllabus the midterms next week. I'm sorry? The midterm is next week, it's set on the syllabus. I'm sorry, you're right. I was conflating it with um, when the notable quotes were given. But you're right. I stand corrected. The midterm is next week. Mm -hmm. um, now all the people who are thinking, ah, stay. You can blame them. No. <laughs> the midterm is next week, and we will be handing out the study guide uh, this week uh, in section. Any other questions? I apologize for my misstatement. Don't want to cause any more confusion than already. Any other questions? Do you have, while we're waiting for Professor Castillo, do you have any questions in general? Or are you just vessels waiting to be filled? Yes. Um, is that um, for the readings for the March 14th? Um, for when we start Waller, um, it doesn't have the asterisks to read for the noble quote. Is, is it okay if we read it for the noble quote? Sure. Okay. One of the things that we, the, the question was, what is the notable quotable text for uh, next week? And that is, um, you start James Waller's book, Becoming Evil. And I would think that that portion is very notable and very quotable. Yeah.
the Japanese atrocities. They killed approximately 30 murders, 30 mil million people in Asia during World War II. And uh, there are several people who have called for regress. Um, I don't know whether you know or not, but the Germans have um, really made some remarkable efforts at paying, uh, admitting their guilt, the responsibility that they all have for what happened uh, under the Nazis. Uh, they have done remarkable things in terms of um, young German kids, when they graduate from high school, many of them go to Israel to live on a, a, a communal uh, farm and work and learn about the Israeli people. Uh, Germany is what we call a philo-Semitic country. And I don't know whether you follow the news, but um, <coughs> in Austria, um, David Irving, who is known as a Holocaust denier, he's a historian, who said that Hitler really didn't know about what was going on, and he didn't particularly believe that that many Jews would be killed, was uh, sentenced to uh, seven years in prison. It's three or seven years in prison for denying the Holocaust. It is against the law in Germany and in Austria and several other countries in Europe to deny the Holocaust, that the Holocaust happened. Yes? Are there any other genocides where the... Could you speak up? Are there any other genocides where that was also happened? Like, it's a legal that never occurred? No. Not that I know. You said that Rwanda decided that um, it never happened? No. It's not against the law. Um, it may be against the law in Turkey to deny that the Armenians were the victims of genocide. Why do you think it might be that, that that's the only place where there's an eye? Are there countries from all of them? Maybe it's sort of we have a national pressure? That's international pressure? International pressure. Could you. Excuse me. What do you mean by international The question is why you asked me whether there was another place where the Holocaust was denied or genocide was denied, and I said no. Um, it's not a particularly good stance to take in Turkey, but.
there, there's a, a central issue that you should know about because not only does it um, influence perhaps what's happening uh, in Japan and other places, certainly in uh, Turkey, is the notion of reparation. The um, Germans confiscated so much in the way of material possessions from Jews and others, but mostly from Jews. I've talked about it in my section. Perhaps you can think back to that. There is a Holocaust uh, survivor who calls it the greatest robbery in the world, um, or in history. Uh, and so, through pressure, many people have been calling governments, etc., to account to come back with their property. Because there were survivors who wanted to have their um, land, their property, their bank accounts, their insurance policies, because they wanted that money back. Um, Germany had to address the notion of reparations. Now, it has gone on now to the point where people who were, who had done slave labor said, we worked for all of these companies for several years. You exploited our labor. We want to be compensated for that. And people like Volkswagen and IG Farben and Bayer, the people who make your aspirin. Uh, several German companies have um, put together funds to pay people for, they can't, certainly can't reimburse them for what, what their labor was worth, but they have been settling for claims. There are several insurance companies who were prohibited from doing business in California and in Washington, foreign insurance companies, until they settled and came up with some sort of plan to pay insurance claims. You know, many people think about it. Six million people were murdered. Not all of them had insurance policies, but many of them did. They paid their premiums like people do. What happened to the money that they had invested in that? So insurance companies were made to go back and look at their files to see whether there were Holocaust victims who had insurance policies. Swiss banks in what appears to be probably um, another very interesting case of a hero. Um, informally, Holocaust survivors would say, and I met one who said, you know, after the, my father told me that after the war I was to go to Switzerland and I was to go to this bank and tell them my name and tell them my father's name and tell them to give me the money he said to me at Auschwitz, there's plenty of money for you if you survive. Just go to this bank and tell them you want the money in the account. And he went. And they said, what's the account number? Do you have proof of this account? And they never took his word for it. I mean, what pieces of paper could you say at Auschwitz? when you were completely stripped of your clothes, et cetera. And went back several times asking for this money. And every single time, he was either put in a bureaucratic loop or <coughs> told that there's no way we can help him. Now, how does this heroism connect? Several years ago, we had a young man by the name of Christoph Miley who came and did a lecture here. And it turns out he was a he was a guard in the Swiss bank. And 
one night he was, he also had an interest in history, and had recently seen the movie Schindler's List. And he um, was closing up for the night. And the last place that he went to close up was the photocopy room. And he went in the photocopy room and he saw in the bin to be shredded a ledger. And being curious, it looked old, he went over and picked it up. And lo and behold, inside that ledger was not only money transfers, but property transfers from a bank that this Swiss bank had bought. They bought all the assets of the bank during the war. And in it were property transfers to the Nazi government in Hamburg. One of the interesting side things that comes in here is that Lucille's family owned apartments that were an apartment building that was confiscated. I often wondered whether her, uh, the information about that had been shredded. But Christoph realized what he had because he had just been sensitized by seeing Schindler's List. And he didn't know what to do, but he took the book home. And he asked his wife. And they are uh, evangelical Christians and believe very much in doing the right thing. And she said to him, you have to tell someone about this. They're shredding all the evidence of this appropriation. And so he went to the head of the Jewish commu community in, uh, I believe it was Geneva, and the head of the Jewish community said, oh dear. This is terrible, it's very explosive. I mean, they've been trying to pin this on the Swiss banks for a long time. They kept saying, you know, we don't have any record of that, the records have been destroyed, et cetera. Uh, make a long story short, he eventually had to contact someone in the United States to tell them what he had. And once this news exploded, uh, and it was about, oh, seven years ago, he could no longer live in Switzerland because he was being persecuted, among other things. Um, lost his job, couldn't find another job. And so he came to the United States um, and was directly responsible because he contacted a lawyer and some people in the Jewish community was directly responsible for holding the Swiss banks to account for what they had done. Well, that's a long story into why the Japanese may not want to admit what they did um, and why the Armenian or the Turks do not want to admit what they did. If you take a look at the map and you will be shown it, during the Armenian lecture, there was a lot of real estate that fell out of Armenian hands and fell into Turkish hands. And the Japanese appropriated a lot of real estate, wealth, etc. during the Second World War. And once that picks up speed, who's next? If there's a precedent set for giving reparations to the victims of genocide and their ancestors. Where does that go? For, for whom? For who? Native Americans. Native Americans, who else? Japanese Americans. Japanese Americans have, have made a settlement. Congress in the United States gave a token payment to Japanese Americans who were relocated. There's a test case now where uh, some African Americans are suing insurance companies who were the insurance of record for some companies that used slave labor. But it kind of rolls on itself in terms of precedent. What, what has happened with the Swiss banks since the The Swiss banks have made um, partial settlements, and they continue to do so. 
because so many people who had assets were murdered, um, they have no heirs, and so the money has been given in, in separate funds to the World Jewish Congress, and they use it to help needy survivors who might need um, medical help, etc. The person who instituted the suit, who actually hired the lawyer to go after the Swiss banks, was uh, 80 years old, insisting that her family had a very large bank account in the Swiss bank and that she wanted it back for the very same reason that Paul Mankel said that his father had told him that he would be okay if he could get the money from the Swiss bank. And uh, she was living in a one-room apartment in Brooklyn, uh, barely getting by on about $600 in Social Security, and had several chronic medical situations. Well, it looks like Professor Castillo has stood us up. What? Oh. Would you um, because of some uncertainty about whether it would be here, I came prepared. I'm prepared every week for um, How many of you have taken an, an AMCS class, um, uh, NA a NAMS class, and with Professor Castillo? Anybody taken one with Professor Castillo? Okay. Um, one of the things he would say to you, if he were here, is that you might find it surprising to know that genocide took place in a place where we could go in just a short car ride. How many of you were aware of that? Where did you learn about that? Where? Where? Cultural anthropology. Elementary school, you learn about genocide. Where did you go to school? Uh, in Santa Clara. In Santa Clara. Who else learned it in high school? What was the question again? The question was, how many of you knew that there was a Native American genocide? That Native Americans were subjected to the conditions? Where did you learn? High school. High school? Mm -hmm. The same. The same. High school? Okay. Did you learn the extent of it? Yeah. Okay. There was a series um, on television called 500 Million. Mm -hmm. um, did any of you see it? I think we probably were in grammar school when it came out. Narrated by Kevin Costner. Has anybody seen any of the 500 Million? It was an eight-part series. I know, cheesy, Kevin Costner. Why did he get the part, do you think? Okay. It dances with wolves. Well, he didn't go native, but he did narrate um, what is a very interesting uh, video. And so uh, we're going to turn that on and we'll watch it. Um, hopefully it will give you some notion of the, the, um, the scope of this genocide. And what I would like you to do is possibly think about some of the conditions that I talked about, um, about, was it last week? Um, about the conditions that have given way to genocide and the effects of genocide. Okay. Wait. Okay, the FBI is watching them.
you turn the sound up for me? nations. First encounters between Europeans and Indian people are some of the most famous and important events in world history. Most of us can recite the names of Christopher Columbus's ships, the year he first landed in the New World, and how he mistakenly called the people he encountered their Indians. But few of us know the names of the people who greeted Columbus, or much about the lives they led. How did they greet the strangers? Were they treated like gods? Were they feared? Were they attacked? Or were they treated as a new and exotic trading partner by a people who had a long history of dealing with other seafaring cultures? The first meeting between European and American worlds would bring two very different cultures into conflict. We take you now to the Caribbean, where the rough road of contact begins. 500 Nations continues with a clash of cultures. damage, how many calamities, disruptions, and devastations of kingdoms have there been? How many souls have perished in the Indies over the years, and how unjustly? How many unforgivable sins have been committed? Bartolomé de las Casas. In December of 1492, three ships under the command of Christopher Columbus approached the second largest island in the Caribbean. For eight weeks, Columbus had traveled from the Bahamas to Cuba, finally reaching the site of modern-day Haiti and the Dominican Republic, the island he would name Hispaniola. The island was then populated by people known as the Taino. One region was controlled by the paramount chief, Okanagari. On Christmas Eve, while coasting along the shore, Columbus's flagship, the Santa Maria, ran aground. When Wakanagari learned the news, he sent all his people from the town with many large canoes to unload everything from the ship. So great was the care and diligence which that king exercised, and he himself was as diligent unloading the ship as in guarding what was taken to land in order that everything would be well cared for. Grateful for the island leader's help, Columbus accepted his invitation to come ashore. The admiral left to dine on shore and arrived at the time when five kings had come, all subject to the one who is called Wakanagari. 
Wakanagari came to receive the Admiral as soon as he had reached land and took him by the arm. Columbus was immediately struck by the beauty of Taino life. The king observes a very wonderful estate in such a dignified manner that it is a pleasure to see. Neither better people nor land can there be. The houses and the villages are so pretty. They love their neighbors as themselves. And they have the sweetest speech in the world. And they're gentle and are always laughing. Christopher Columbus. As a token of gratitude for the rescue of his men and supplies, Columbus presented Wakanagari with a red cape, a prestigious item among the Taino elite. In return, Wakanagari gave Columbus a golden tiara he wore on his head. To Wakanagari, it was a fair exchange a gesture of mutual respect and recognition, the opening of trade between equals. To Columbus, it was a crown, a symbol of authority. Wakanagari was surrendering his lands and people to Spain. But Columbus was not simply looking to rule people. He saw something much more valuable to his future. He saw gold the prize he could take back to his sponsors in Europe. There was wealth to be had, and to the Europeans of the time, wealth belonged to those strong enough to take it. Now, I have ordered my men to build a tower and a fort. Not that I believe it to be necessary, but it is obvious that with this man that I bring, I could subdue all of this island, since the people are naked and without arms. But it is right that this tower be made, so that with love and fear, they will open it. of men in a fort built from the timbers of the Santa Maria. Columbus set sail for Europe. With him, he would carry the news of a new world, gold and docile island natives. Wakanagari and the Taino had no way of knowing what was about to happen to their ancient way of life. The Taino's ancestors were part of a series of migrations of South American Indian people dating back over 2,000 years. They farmed the land and harvested the wealth of the sea. Taino traders traveled in huge ocean-going canoes capable of carrying up to 150 men. Boats laden with feathers, gold, wood, pottery, beautiful birds, cotton fabric, and food. Island nations were woven together by trade. Trade was the communication system by which nations knew one another and maintained peace. Some trading partners even exchanged their names to create lasting bonds between their communities. By the time of contact, there were well over a million people living in the Caribbean. Local community leaders were subject to powerful regional leaders like Wakanagari, who controlled trade with large personal fleets and warehouses of commodities. Into this world, Columbus returned in November 1493 with a military flotilla of 17 ships. Under his command, armor-clad soldiers, mounted cavalry, attack dogs, and guns. The Spanish conquest of the Caribbean began. Gold mines were opened, and the Taino were enslaved, forced to mine the ore. 
a Spanish priest, Bartolomé de las Casas, who accompanied Columbus on his second voyage, spoke out against the cruel treatment of the Taino people. It is not possible to recount the hundredth part of what I have seen with my own eyes. A man had need to have a body of iron to undergo the labor they endured in getting gold out of the mines. They must delve and search a hundred times over in the inner parts of the mountains till they dig them down from top to bottom. They must work the very rocks hollow. Bartolomé de las Casas. Epidemics and famine swept the island. Yet the Spanish continued to demand that the beleaguered Taino supply them with both food and labor. Garrisons were strung across the island to fortify the gold fields. When resistance sprang up, Columbus sent out military units to terrorize towns into submission. persecuted and pursued with their wives and children up into the hills, so tired, hungry, and harassed. And there went with them disease, death, and misery, just as if they had been killed in the wars. They died of hunger and sickness that surrounded them, and the fatigue and oppression that followed. After 1496, no more than a third remained of the multitudes that had been on the island. Taino suffering was so severe that thousands took their own lives rather than submit. Wherefore many went to the woods and there hung themselves after having killed their children, saying it was far better to die than to live so miserably. Some threw themselves from the high cliffs down the services. Others jumped into the sea, and others stabbed themselves to death. Bezon, a soldier for Spain. Some escaped into the mountains, including Wakanagari, the paramount chief who had befriended Columbus. He soon died, a homeless wanderer. By 1503, Eleven years after Columbus's first voyage, only a few pockets of resistance remained. In the mountainous region of Charawa, Taino people ruled by a woman named Ana Kauna successfully evaded Spanish demands for labor. Determined to break the resistance, the Spanish governor requested a diplomatic meeting. Ana Kauna agreed and summoned 80 regional sub-chiefs to her state house for the meeting. When the 80 leaders were gathered inside, the governor gave a signal and the thatched state house was set on fire. Soldiers lined up outside with swords. Taino leaders who did not burn were killed as they fled the blaze. Anacaona was spared, only to be later executed by hanging. In the aftermath of the bloody carnage, a little boy stood among the ashes and smoke beside the charred remains of his father, a boy whose name the Spanish would come to remember well, Enrique. The child who witnessed the murder of his father and the other Taino leaders in Charawa was taken away from the killing field by a Spanish priest. He was placed in the care of missionaries and baptized Enrique. 
Although raised by Spaniards, he never forgot his own identity. Heir to the chiefdom of the Bajoruco region of the island. Enrique was a tall and graceful man with a well-proportioned body. His face was neither handsome nor ugly, but that of a serious and stern man. He married a native, a woman of excellent and noble lineage, named Doña Lucia, Bartolomé de las Casas. The Spanish government created a labor grant system under which individual Spanish landholders were given village populations to use as forced labor. Enrique, his wife, and his people were turned over to a debauched young Spaniard named Valenzuela. They were at his mercy. The priest, Las Casas, protested. In a more just world, Enrique would have been the master. Valenzuela viewed Enrique as a slave and valued him less than manure in the street. Enrique complied with Valenzuela's tyrannical demands, for which he was rewarded with regular beatings and robbed of his last remaining possessions. His many appeals to Spanish authorities fell on deaf ears. When Valenzuela raped his wife, Enrique reached his breaking point. He and his followers escaped to their homelands in the lofty Pajoruco mountains. The Spanish came to call him the rebel Enrique, and those who followed him were termed rebels and insurgents. Although in truth they were not rebelling, but only fleeing from their cruel enemies who were misusing and destroying them just as a cow or an ox tries to escape from the slaughterhouse. Bartolomé de las Casas. Enrique organized his people. Women, children, and elderly were sent into caves high in the mountains, where they raised chickens and cultivated gardens to feed the resistance army. Scouts were posted on every crag and pass. Heavy boulders rolled into place above the footpaths. Enrique instructed his men to fight only in self-defense, to kill Spaniards only in the course of battle, and otherwise to simply deprive them of their arms. At first, the Spanish army was confident they would quickly crush the Taino resistance. But Enrique's people, armed only with spears, iron spikes, fish bones, and bows and arrows, fought with fierce determination against the Spanish and their sophisticated arms. Time after time, they forced the enemy to retreat. During one fierce battle, Valenzuela himself was captured. But even this mortal enemy's life would be spared. Enrique ordered him released. As word of Enrique's victory spread across the island, Many Taino fled to his refuge and joined the fight for freedom. His legend grew. It was said that Enrique never slept at night, that he himself patrolled the village until dawn. For over a decade, he fought Spain to a standstill. Finally, unable to defeat the guerrillas on their own territory, an exhausted and humiliated Spanish government made overtures of peace. I know the Spanish very well, because they killed my father and grandfather and all the people of the kingdom of Sharawa, and reduced the population of the entire island of Española. I have fled to my own land, where neither I nor any of my followers are harming anyone, but are simply defending ourselves against those who came to capture and kill us. I need not talk to another Spaniard. Enrique. Taino. But there was one Spaniard to whom Enrique would still talk, the priest Las Casas. 
After many years spent demanding the king act to stop Spanish atrocities in the New World, Las Casas had been officially designated Protector of the Indians. He now sought out Enrique in his mountain stronghold. Two months later, Las Casas and Enrique appeared before Spanish authorities and negotiated a truce. Fourteen years after it began, the rebellion came to an end, but only after the Spanish agreed to guarantee freedom for Enrique's people. At the base of the Cibao Mountains, Enrique settled with his 4,000 followers, the last members of a culture that had flourished for millennia. By the end of the century, the Taino population that Las Casas had estimated at 2 million was officially reported extinct. What does the name DeSoto mean to me? It means the personification of evil. spring of 1539, less than 50 years after Columbus, less than 20 years after the fall of the Aztec Empire, Spanish conquistador Hernando de Soto landed on the West Florida coast north of present-day Tampa Bay. He rode at the head of a 600-man army, 200 mountain they were supported by 100 servants, herds of horses, pack animals, swine, and trained attack dogs. Unable to carry the quantity of food needed to support the massive expedition, De Soto would feed his men and animals on the bounty of the towns they entered. The invaders came prepared to take their provisions by force. In July, De Soto struck north into the lands of the Timucua people, chiefdoms of fishermen and farmers scattered across the northern Florida Peninsula.
this is our answer, both for the present and forevermore. De Soto entered Irutina's town with his army in battle formation, but oddly, they met no resistance. The chief, who had promised such defiance, seemed to have completely submitted, but the surface belied the reality. While the Spaniards gorged upon the town's food stores, Urutina secretly summoned fighting men from throughout the region. Then, playing out a military chess game, the young chief invited De Soto to witness Timucua military maneuvers in a large field. His plan? To amass his army and launch a surprise attack on the Spanish force. But De Soto had been forewarned by a spy. Matching the Indian leader move for move, he brought his army to the field in battle formation. To the rear of the Timucua force were two lakes. To their flanks were forests, and in front of them, the Spanish army. Suddenly, De Soto gave a signal. Urutina was seized, and the Spaniards attacked. The Spanish cavalry thundered forward, their horses' hooves driving into the Timucuan ranks. Outmatched, the Indian force fell back. Some ran towards the shelter of the trees. Hundreds more plunged into the lake nearby, swimming out into the deep water to evade their pursuers. The Spaniards fired into the lake, trying to force the Timucua to surrender. Indian resistors had to tread water constantly, but by nightfall, not a single man had yielded. A Spanish chronicler observed the agonizing struggle. And now, they continued to torment the Indians, never once letting them set foot on the shore, hoping that they would become exhausted by the swimming, and as a result, give up the more quickly. Thus, they threatened with death those who would not surrender. Regardless of how much the Castilians afflicted them, they could not do enough to keep them from showing their spirit and strength. For even though these men realized that they were without hope of help in the hardships and danger they were experiencing, some chose death as a lesser evil. It was not until late the following morning that 200 survivors surrendered in a body. They had been swimming 24 hours, and it was a great pity to see them emerge from the lagoon, half drowned and swollen and transfixed by the toil, hunger, fatigue, and lack of sleep they had suffered. Garcilaso de la Vega, Spanish chronicler. The remaining seven were dragged out of the water at knife point by De Soto's men. The Timucuan prisoners were chained and distributed among the Spanish soldiers as slaves. Urutina was imprisoned inside his own state house. He would make one last act of defiance. Pretending to have passively accepted his defeat, he lulled De Soto within his reach. Suddenly, he lunged at the Spanish leader, smashing his face with chained fists. The chief gave out such a tremendous roar that it could be heard for a quarter of a league around. The blow was so fierce that the soda was unconscious for more than half an hour, and he bled through the eyes, nose, and mouth. Simultaneously, Urutina was gored by twelve swordsmen. Outside, the Timucua fell upon their captors, fighting with stones, pots of boiling food, anything at hand. The Spaniards turned upon them, killing indiscriminately. They were valiant and spirited people, and had they found themselves free, 
would have done more harm. With all that, imprisoned as they were, they tried to do everything they could, and for this reason, the Spaniards killed each of them, not permitting a single one to live, which was a great pity. In a certain way, I feel like the land has a memory of its own, and the memory of the suffering can still be felt in the southeastern United States. You can go into sites where Indian villages, and even we might say cities, once were, and you can see the ruins, you can see the mounds where people were buried, and you don't see the people. And you know immediately there was a great and tragic story there. So I think that the story still lives, even if it's not in our history books, it's in the land itself. Having laid waste to the Timucua, De Soto marched his army north. In the spring of 1540, he approached a town near present-day Columbia, South Carolina. Cofita Chequi, a farming community with a religious and social heritage reaching back to the ancient mound builders. The army's approach was monitored by the people of Cofita Chequi. They hid what they could of their food stores and sent their elderly chiefess away to a town removed from De Soto's path. When De Soto reached the bank of the watery river, the niece of the old chiefess crossed the river to meet him. Relying on diplomacy rather than military force, she hoped to persuade the Spaniard to spare her people. The mistress of her town and eight of her ladies embarked in a canoe, which had been covered with a great canopy and adorned with ornaments. It was towed by a second one which bore six principal Indians and many oarsmen. In this manner, they all crossed the river. The mistress of Kofita Cheki came before De Soto and, after paying her respects, seated herself upon a chair which her subjects had brought for her. She alone spoke with the governor. Excellent Lord, although my possibility does not equal my wishes, for goodwill is more worthy than all the treasures of the world which may be offered without it. With very sincere and open goodwill, I offer you my person, my lands, my vassals, and this poor service. Unwrapping a great strand of pearls from her neck, she presented them to De Soto. Struck with admiration, De Soto called her the Lady of Kofita Chequi. But her generosity and graciousness would not prevent the plunder of her town. The Spaniards feasted on 600 bushels of corn. They looted the graves and temples for pearls. Then De Soto demanded that the old chiefess be summoned from hiding to gain her submission. Finally, a 21-year-old adopted son of the chiefess was pressed into leading the army to her. The Spaniards marched out of town behind the young guide, stopping some time later in the forest to eat. He began to grow morose and to sit contemplatively with his hand on his cheek. He gave some long and profound sighs. Then, as he sat in the midst of the Spaniards, he began to remove his arrows one at a time and very slowly. Observing that the Castilians were not watching him, he struck himself in the gullet in such a way as to inflict a mortal wound and thus died instantly. 
When the Indian bearers were asked why the boy had taken his life, they explained. He realized that the act of guiding these people to his mother's present location was unworthy of the love she bore him. The elderly chieftess remained undiscovered. But before resuming his march, De Soto took her young niece, the Lady of Kafita Cheki, as his hostage. After days of traveling west, she managed a daring escape, even recovering some of the plundered pearls. De Soto would not pursue her. He moved on, crossing the Appalachian Mountains. In July, he traveled down a broad river into the territory of the Coosa, what is now northern Alabama. The Spaniards were amazed by the size and wealth of the Coosa nation, where a single day's march took them through 12 towns, each surrounded by vast fields of crops. When they reached the Coosa capital, they were met on the road by a thousand men wearing great feathered headdresses and bearing their young chief on a litter. After replenishing their supplies, De Soto and his men departed without serious incident. With them, they would take stories of Cusa wealth that would become legendary in Spain. As the army headed west, they left behind one man too sick to travel, a decision that would shatter the Cusa world. On October 18, 1540, De Soto arrived at the fortified town of Movina in the territory of the powerful Mobile nation. The Mobile had been preparing for this moment. Inside a strong defensive wall replete with towers, a war council was in progress. Upon the arrival of the Spaniards, a man described as a captain general was sent out to confront them. Who are these thieves and vagabonds who keep shouting? Come forth, come forth, with as little consideration as if they were talking with some such person as themselves. No one can endure longer the insolence of these demons, and it is therefore only right that they die today, torn into pieces for their infamy, and that in this way an end be given to their wickedness and tyranny. As he finished speaking, the Captain General was struck down with a Spanish sword. Instantly, thousands of Mobile fighters spilled out, driving back the Spaniards, fighting so fiercely they even grabbed the Cavaliers' lances by the blades. The Indians fought with so great spirit that they drove us outside again and again. Help us, Spanish crime. But the Spanish soldiers broke through the town's fortifications with battle axes and drove the Mobile inside their homes. De Soto ordered the houses set on fire. Wind fanned with flames, engulfing the town in thick smoke, while De Soto kept the trumpets, fifes, and drums blaring. And yet, the Mobile battled ever more desperately. Women fought frantically beside the men, prompting one Spanish soldier to say, they fought with the desire to die. Finally, at sunset, after nine hours of battle, it ended. Eyewitness estimates of the Mobile dead ranged up to 11,000. Bodies littered the streets between the charred remains of buildings. Even the Spaniards reeled in shock. One soldier emerged from the silence of the aftermath, frozen like a wooden statue, until he died. A Mobile fighting man hung himself by his bowstring rather than be left to survive alone. 82 of De Soto's men died, and every one of his soldiers was wounded, many seriously. 
For a month, the army was forced to stop and recover. Then, as the surrounding Indian nations watched in horror, De Soto renewed his march. But his army had been weakened. The tide was beginning to turn. In April of 1541, the invaders reached the Mississippi River. There, De Soto heard stories of the powerful Natchi Nation, direct inheritors of the Grand Mississippian culture. Natchi influence, both economic and military, spread in all directions along the Mississippi. Their temple pyramids rose majestically along the banks of the rivers. The Natchi paramount chief, Quigalta, was heir to the tradition of the great sons and spiritual head of a powerful religious aristocracy. His title was Son of the Sun. He was carried on a litter so his feet would never touch the ground. His head was flattened according to Natchi custom and tattoos of black, red, and blue designs were etched across his body. De Soto, claiming that he too was a child of the sun, summoned the Natchi leader to the Spanish camp. Quigaltum sent back his reply. With respect to what De Soto said about being the son of the sun, let him dry up the great river, and I will believe him. With respect to the rest, I am not accustomed to visit anyone. On the contrary, all of whom I have knowledge, visit and serve me, and obey me, and pay me tribute. Quigalta, Nazi. De Soto would never meet Quigalta, or see the wealth of the Nazi. On May 21st, 1542, he died. His body was buried in the Mississippi. Over the following year, De Soto's army ventured as far west as Texas before returning to the Mississippi. There, they built a flotilla and headed downriver for the Gulf of Mexico. magnificently painted Natchi canoes arrayed in battle formation. Seated under canopies, fighting men dressed in vivid colors and wearing large headdress plumes drove the Spanish boats out of Natchi territory and downriver, where one tribe after another picked up the pursuit. The Spaniards reached the Gulf of Mexico on July 18, 1543 setting sail for Spanish outposts on the Mexican coast. For the American Indian nations, De Soto's expedition mercifully came to an end. But it would not be the end of De Soto's influence on the continent. Twenty years later, another expedition would enter the southeast, this time to colonize. In Spain, the agricultural wealth of the region had become legendary, but the new arrivals found few people and could barely survive. In desperation, they traveled north to the land of the Cusa, where De Soto's army had passed through 12 thriving towns on a single day's march. But instead of the fabled towns, they found ruins and temple mounds deserted and overgrown. And instead of populations of thousands, they found only pockets of survivors. Our village had once been very great and populous. But other men similar to you destroyed it and forced us to run away in fear. Unknown to De Soto, the sick man he had left with the Cusa carried a weapon far more deadly than Spanish arms. 
while the army carved a path of destruction through the southeast. A hidden enemy that would take more Indian lives than all the generals and conquistadors combined was secretly traveling among them. The Europeans had tremendous uh, immunity and resistance to the diseases that they had known for tens of thousands of years. Smallpox, uh, even the plague, chickenpox, whooping cough, measles, mumps. The Indians had no epidemic diseases. None of these were there. Consequently, they had no immunities, absolutely no resistance. So a, a disease as simple as its mumps that we think of today as a childhood disease, it would come into an Indian community and quite possibly kill off 20% of the village. Then the next year, another disease could come through, such as smallpox, and kill off perhaps 30% of the village. So the Indians were tremendously weakened by disease. Knowledge was lost as elders died suddenly. Nations were thrown into upheaval. In less than 20 years, civilizations that had flourished for centuries swirled into oblivion. Our next hour looks to North America's east coast, from the Arctic to Virginia. There the Indian nations would meet another European power, the English. Please join us for part four of 500 Nations, Invasion of the Coast. What I had hoped uh, when Professor Castillo came was to talk about the experience in California. Uh, I don't, um, that's not my field, but I don't imagine that the experience was much different than what we've just seen here. And I uh, chose, this is an eight part series, and I chose this one because I think it summarizes best um, the situation that um, native people faced. Um, in terms of how devastating contact with the um, European peoples were. Um, have any of you read Howard Zinn's A History of American People? The first part of this history does not spare much. This was somewhat cleaned up for you in terms of how uh, Columbus and the original uh, colonizers treated the native people. I mean, this is not a pretty picture, but um, they were especially brutal uh, in their efforts to get uh, the native people to give up what they felt was the important riches of silver and gold. Um, I encourage you to perhaps look into this so that you can get more information and be more informed about, you know, we're spending a lot of time talking about genocide in, in Europe. Uh, next week we're going to hear about things that happen in Asia and we're going to talk about um, the Armenian genocide, the Armenian genocide that's happening now. But none should be more vital in your mind than the very genocide that happened um, where you are, and you are the inheritors. If the German people continue to um, be responsible for the genocide that they that took place in their, in their country, and certainly we must constantly be aware that we have inherited that legacy on our own. Do you have any questions or comments? Um, okay, we'll see you all uh, in the session tomorrow.